Why don't you come on up, please? Are we ready to go on the video camera? We're rolling up, huh? okay. Uh, I would like to um, <clears throat> introduce uh, Dr. Lee Cowden, who's going to give you his own uh, short version of uh, curriculum vita. Oh, you want me to help you pass that out? Yeah. Just split the evenly. Then just start into whatever you're going to do. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Is this on? Can you hear it back there? Okay. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, it is. Which the 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 red is lit up, and he says he hears me. Yeah. Now you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Who's the right way? You can tell we don't get a course in electronics in medical school. I think. Can you hear me now? I think I'm going to do like Dr. Speckhart did and get down here at the uh, table so I can show some overheads. For those of you just now coming in, uh, we passed some handouts back toward the back, so the extras are probably at the back. <coughs> Did everybody that wants to get wants a handout get a handout? Okay. <coughs> well, I want to start by introducing myself. Uh, well, first, first of all, let me say. Uh, that I'm very honored to be able to address your group here. Um, I addressed a uh, dental group in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, a couple months back and uh, have seen a couple of familiar faces from that meeting. Uh, we'll try to cover some additional ma material this time that uh, keeps it from being quite so boring. Um, I uh, feel like there's a, a few in the audience that uh, probably should be up here giving this talk to me because I feel like they have uh, a greater degree of uh, knowledge and experience. Uh, one of those is Dr. Scheidel on the back row. And uh, we may try to solicit some of his comments after I'm finished. Uh, I'm a uh, board certified internal medicine and cardiology doctor uh, living in Dallas, Texas. I uh, went to medical school in Houston and in internal medicine residency and fellowship in uh, internal medicine residency and cardiology fellowship and critical care fellowship in St. Louis, Missouri. And I lived up there for about five years after I finished practicing, after I finished training and then went back in, uh, to, to Dallas to uh, set up a practice. When I was in, uh, when I was growing up, I had um, several experiences with natural medicine that uh, kept me from being as uh, negative toward the concept of alternative medicine when I finally went into medical school and I, and I consider that uh, a blessing. My, uh, all of my grandmothers, uh, maternal, paternal, and uh, some of the other relatives were using herbs and whatnot to uh, help heal common conditions, uh, ratchet, rashes and itches and pains and whatnot. And so I knew that it worked. When I got into uh, medical school, I was under a lot of stress and I developed a lot of allergy problems, nasal sinus allergies, congestion, uh, frequent viral infections, and was having a hard time 
going to class and uh, just standing up to the day-to-day uh, -day routine. And I went to the chief of the pulmonary department for help. Well, first the chief of, it, of the ENT department and did what he asked me to do and I didn't get any better. And then I went to the chief of the pulmonary department and asked uh, what to do and he told me what to do and I did that and that didn't help either. So then about that time my uh, wife's grandmother uh, came to visit us in Houston where I was going to medical school and she said, uh, you don't look so well. <laughs> and uh, I, yeah, she made the diagnosis. <laughs> um, she said, uh, it looks like you're having uh, allergy problems and you're having virus infections too. I said, yeah. She said, well, why don't you try to take these uh, vitamins and minerals and a few herbs and see if it doesn't help. And I said, well, you know, I've already gone through my 30 minute nutrition course and uh, I know that probably won't work, but I'll do it to humor you. And so I started on the things that she, that she suggested, and uh, in about two weeks I was feeling very good. And uh, I was a little hard-headed in those days. She, she went home, and a few months later she came back to visit us, and uh, she said, you look like you're doing pretty well. And I said, yes, thank you. She said, are you still taking your vitamins and herbs? I said, yes. She said, well, it works, doesn't it? And uh, <coughs> I, I was reluctant to, to admit that to her, so I said, well, it, I probably was, it was probably time for me to get well anyway. So <laughs> I, uh, like a fool, went off the vitamins and minerals, and uh, within just a few days, I was uh, ill again. So from that point forward, I started looking uh, at each course that I took in medical school with a different uh, perspective and trying to learn things in a different way. One other fortunate event that occurred in my life, uh, when I went into college, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And so I was kind of goofing around and not making that great of grades. And so uh, the people I was hanging, I was taking science courses because I thought I wanted to be some kind of scientist. And the people I was hanging around with were all pre-med. And before you know it, I was indoctrinated and uh, switched over to pre-med. And uh, when I applied for medical school the first time, my grade point average was only 3.5 and that wasn't high enough to get in at that time to the medical school. So um, for the year that I was waiting to reapply, I took a uh, master's degree course in biochemistry and physiology with the medical students at the university where I was doing my graduate work. And then when I got into medical school, I took those same courses again, so I got double dosed. Well, bio biochemistry and physiology are the backbone of orthomolecular medicine and that's what I believe that I practice to a large degree nowadays and if, if you can get a fairly good understanding of biochemistry and physiology uh, you can understand and physics now <laughs> you can you can understand a lot about alternative medicine unfortunately I didn't have the same background in physics so that one's been more like uh, pulling teeth <laughs> No pun intended. Can everybody see that? <clears throat> um, in medical school, when we were doing our uh, his history and physical rotation course to uh, learn how to do histories and physicals, I noticed a lot of my student colleagues making little notes in the chart, uh, eyes, WNL, nose, WNL, ears, WNL. And so I said, hmm, within normal limits, that sounds pretty easy. I'll just do that instead of having to write out within normal limits. So I started doing that until I found out that they meant we never looked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. <clears throat> Galileo in his time had the same problem. He couldn't get his peers to look at the truth, to look what was out there. Uh, analogy in, in what I've been doing recently is uh, a little bit of uh, dark field microscopy. There's a lot, of, a lot of information there that I can't get my colleagues to look at uh, because they know that they were taught everything that there could be known about microscopy when they went through medical school. and so. They're never looking.
I was supposed to talk about uh, detoxification today, and before we can start into talking about detoxification, I think we need to understand what toxicity is. I came up with a working definition, and I call it a working definition because as I learn more things, my paradigm keeps shifting. And so I'm going to give you what my defini definition of toxicity is today, or a toxic substance that is. A, a toxin is a substance or an energy form either produced within the body or acquired by the body from the surrounding environment. Which causes at some concentration the body to deviate from health. Now, I defined it that way because in the last two or three years especially, I've, I've learned to respect and appreciate the effect of uh, magnetic fields and radiation and other frequencies on our health, and uh, we sure as heck didn't learn about that in medical school. And I've, I've come to believe that the body is, a, is an energetic being as well as a biochemical being, and so you cannot ignore that, otherwise you're going to miss at least half the story. On the uh, outline on, on Roman numeral one, um, we talk about the sequential consequences of tissue toxicity, the gradual accumulation of those toxins that we just defined over time. I've, I've heard a couple of uh, well-known doctors describe uh, the sequential events of toxicity like a 10-act play being performed. And we start accumulating toxins at the time of conception, not at the time of birth, at the time of conception in utero. And the, the act one starts because we live in a polluted environment. And the first three acts occur without our knowledge because we have no symptoms during the first three acts. And Roman numeral A under one starts act four. So we're already way behind the eight ball. And I've come to respect and appreciate kinesiology and electroacupressure, electroacupuncture diagnostics as a way to find out what's going on in Act 1, 2, and 3 before we ever get to Act 4 and 5. So we're ahead of the game. We can see disease coming before we can see it with symptoms. Act 6 and 7 takes over in Roman numeral B. Act 8 and 9 occurs in Roman numeral C. And Act 10 is the curtain, the close of life, death. Um, the way I look at it is that we start out with minor symptoms uh, in Act 4 and 5 that uh, no conventional doctor recognizes as being truly an illness process. It's an it's a, uh, inconvenient symptom of some type, fatigue or headaches or something. And as more toxins accumulate in the body and we become more nutritionally depleted and so on, the, uh, the act, five and, uh, act 5 and finally Act 6 starts. And when Act 6 starts, we actually are fairly ill. But the doctors still haven't put a, a fixed named end organ disease to it. So we can't label it yet, okay? Well, is it going to be lupus? I don't know. Is it going to be cancer? I don't know. We got something bad, but and this person is probably not a hypochondriac, so it's probably something. Yes, sir? It's called the worried well. Yes, that's right. That's what the conventional <laughs> community, I think, calls, calls the worried well, as he says. Uh, and then finally you get into Act 8 and 9 with uh, end-stage fixed name disease, and you start getting the real heavy drugs. In, in Acts 4 through 7, you get uh, you know, Tylenol and maybe some sleep medication and things like that to relieve symptoms. But then in eight, Acts 8 and 9, you usually get into the real big drugs like uh, you know, uh, large doses of antibiotics or large doses of steroids, etc. 
And then if you don't uh, turn around at that point, which is a pretty late act, <coughs> then uh, death eventually ensues uh, because of either um, some, kind of, some kind of advanced organ degeneration in a, in a final event, a heart attack, uh, a respiratory <coughs> arrest, uh, whatever, mm -hmm. a septic event, an, an anaphylactic reaction if it's an allergic reaction. Okay, in the, in the next part of the talk, I want to, want to um, have you look uh, at both Roman numerals 2 and 3 simultaneously for each letter that we talk about. So when we talk about A, loss of nutrients, we're going to talk about the cause and the treatment at the same time. Before I get into that, um, C. Everett Koop, uh, when he was Surgeon General of the United States, estimated that of the 2.1 million people that die in the United States each year, that 1.6 million of them die because of causes related to poor nutrition. Okay. When I look at, yeah, of, of 2.1 million, 1.6 die from nutrition-related causes. These are acts eight and nine of our play. And if they, the heart attack, if it's not uh, treated, results in death from heart attack. Now, these are, all of these, and we can, we'll talk about accidents uh, as possibly being related to uh, toxicity and poor, poor nutrition also, but I think that uh, the, the evidence strongly suggests that all of the rest of those are nutrition and toxin related. Uh, let me give you an example. Suicide. Suicide usually follows depression. Depression usually uh, follows either uh, amino acid imbalances, mineral imbalances, uh, certain types of, of B vitamin deficiencies or very severe electromagnetic disturbance or one of the miasms that was discussed this morning. So um, those, are, those are environmental and nutrition related causes of suicide indirectly. Does everybody follow that? Okay. And so you can say the same about any of the rest of those. I look at the fact that most people that have accidents uh, have poor uh, judgment or poor reflex time, so I think some of those are related to uh, toxicity and, and nutrition as well. <coughs> Dr. Bill Ray in his book Chemical Sensitivity uh, pictured the process like this. Uh, I have a little bit different uh, concept of the toxic load syndrome that finally results in uh, the acts to unfold in our toxic uh, events of life. The, the picture that I use is with several spigots at the top of this barrel, each flowing in something that you don't want in your toxic load dump of the human body and a single drain at the bottom of the barrel uh, or maybe several small drains. The drains being things that remove toxins from the body, better nutritional status, uh, chelation, removing the wrong materials from the mouth, uh, cleaning up the environment that you sleep in and live in each day and so on. We'll refer back to this type of concept uh, some during the talk. You notice that high up in the barrel is the uh, all the electromagnetic issues and uh, one that I've come to respect and appreciate recently is the uh, is the geomagnetic or geopathic fields, the, uh, the grid. And uh, as Dr. Scheidel calls it, uh, telluric radiation. I have patients that, uh, I'll give a quick example. A woman comes into me, to my office in Dallas about two years ago with fatigue. Looks healthy, but complaining of fatigue. So we did an evaluation, 
physical exam was normal. Did a lot of blood work. Only thing we could find was one uh, crackpot test that suggests that she might have a cancer. So we do a very sophisticated uh, test called the anti-malignant antibody and serum through Dr. Bogosh's lab in, in uh, Boston, which has been validated in thousands of patients. And sure enough, her AMAS test is abnormal. So we know that she has a malignancy somewhere in her body. We send her to the nuclear imaging people, and they find that she, by nuclear spec uh, gallium scanning, that she has a hot spot in her retroperitoneum of her, of her belly. Uh, very, very consistent with lymphoma. And she didn't want to have chemotherapy or surgical excision. And she, and she said, is there anything that I can do for myself for a while, since this hasn't manifest except by fatigue, to see if this can be reversed? I said, you can try. It's your, you know, it's your choice. So far, it's still her choice in the United States. I don't know for how much longer. But she, uh, she embarked on a... Uh, a program. Now she was already on a very good diet. She was already on some supplemental nutrients that I agreed with. She was on uh, an exercise program, a stress reduction program. She was doing a lot of good things for herself already. So we didn't have a lot of things to add to her her uh, regimen. But she started those things. I saw her back in six weeks, and uh, she was a little bit better, but not as much improved as I'd hoped she would be. And she brought her husband along with her. So he had. Uh, um, no symptoms at all, but she wanted him to have the same evaluation that she had had. So we did that, and that included the crackpot cancer test, the dark field microscopy I'm referring to, and the uh, AMAS. And both of them were abnormal. And he said, I, I don't want to spend $2,000 to find out where this is. Can't you just treat me like you treat my wife? Because <laughs> she's, she's feeling better. I said, that's up to you. So that's what he decided to do. I said. We have two unrela genetically unrelated people in the same household with a uh, malignant condition. And they're both on a good diet, both on supplemental nutrients, both have a good lifestyle, both exercise, both are happy with life. Uh, the only thing that, that I could think of would be some type of electromagnetic cause of their malignancies. So we sent an electromagnetic specialist trained at the Bohr Biological Institute in Germany out to their house to take some measurements. And over their bed, he found 150 times the normal level of electromagnetic radiation, elect electromagnetic energies. When he unplugged the radio alarm clock on each side of the bed and the television at the foot of the bed, the level of electromagnetic pollution dropped almost to normal. They left those three appliances unplugged for the next two months. I saw him back in the office, did an exam, did an AMAS test. Their cancer was gone, both of them. And they've remained gone since then. So what that little uh, incident taught me is that uh, we need to think of everything. And you know, when something doesn't seem to mesh in your thought process, in your paradigm, try to think of other things. I should say something. The, uh, the molds um, and the yeast and the problems down here at the bottom, uh, the, the the funguses and the yeast produce uh, aflatoxins within our body. Uh, aflatoxins are, are cancer-causing, immune-suppressing, or immune-altering, I should say, uh, chemical substances that are heat-stable, so they're not destroyed by cooking foods. So if you, uh, the most common place you find aflatoxins probably in, in our environment is in uh, moldy grains that are fed to the beef and the chicken that we eat every day, okay? So it doesn't, doesn't do any good to cook this chicken or, or beef because that toxic aflatoxin is still at the same level it was before you cooked it. <coughs> so how do these toxins uh, hurt us? This is just one, one additional slide out of uh, Bill Ray's book <coughs> that gives a few of the mechanisms on the, on the cell membrane. The cell membrane is a, is a bilipid layer, hydro, hydrophobic on the outside, hydrophilic <coughs> on the inside, with proteins wedged in between some of the lipids to uh, facilitate communication from the exterior of the cell to the interior of the cell. Well, we'll see uh, 
in most uh, organic solvents and pesticides and other hydrocarbons that we, that we come into contact with every day, those are fat-soluble substances that wedge themselves into this bilipid membrane. And guess what? It disturbs it. It disrupts the membrane, the, the integrity of the membrane. The def Does anybody know the definition of life of a cell? That's right. And what, what maintains that? The cell membrane. So if the cell membrane is disrupted enough, the cell dies. Or becomes very diseased at least. So you can see that, uh, that the chemicals work on uh, the lipid layer, they work on adenylate cyclase, they work on, uh, probably work on the G protein that was recently described, um, as well as uh, sometimes altering antigen antibody res response on the surface of the cell and so on hormone receptor response. This is a very, very busy slide. Uh, this is just some of the mechanisms of chemical exposure on causing illness. But what happens is that the immune system usually becomes disrupted. Either it becomes excessively active, in which case we have an autoimmune process developed, or it becomes uh, suppressed, in which case you get frequent infections. When you get frequent infections in the conventional medical community in the United States, you get antibiotics. When you get antibiotics, you usually develop overgrowth of yeast and fungus in the gut. When you overgrowth the yeast and fungus in the gut, you get other immune suppressive chemicals being released from those yeasts and funguses. So then you get a, a vicious cycle started. Um, we're going to go over some of the other, other mechanisms uh, as we go along here. This is an example of how the chemical toxins affect our, our bone marrow. Oops, cut the bottom of it off. hold it, I guess. Okay, so we see that some of these chemicals result in an injury to the stem cell, which was talked about yesterday by Dr. Farr. Um, and we see that that alters the production of one example, lymphocytes. If the lymphocytes are suppressed, then you get, uh, if, the, if the B lymphocytes are suppressed, you get a, re a gradual reduction in antibody production and then the frequent bacterial infections and the things that result from that. If you get a suppression of the T lymphocytes, then you get a, a suppression of the lymphokines and the, and the cell mediated uh, reactions against viruses, yeast, and so on, and cancer cells. If you get a, a stimulation of either type, then you get uh, some type of, uh, of leukemia. This is some of the mechanisms of chemical toxins on the, um, on the vascular wall. The vascular wall has a purpose of moving blood through the system, uh, allowing a little bit of fluid and some nutrients to move out of the vessel to allow toxins that are in the tissues to move back in the vessel. When you get uh, any one of these types of of allergic type reactions created that disrupts the vascular wall membrane. And you definitely don't get toxins moving back the right direction because you develop a hydrostatic pressure against their movement in the right direction because fluids are moving out of the vascular wall faster than they should. And the lymph system gets over clogged, overburdened. And most people will develop uh, some degree of puffiness. And you can see that in some of the people in this audience, you see kind of a puffiness either under the eyes or somewhere on the face. And you know, we're, we're all uh, walking time bombs waiting to go into a later act. Anybody remember biochemistry? This is enough, the little, little circle numbers are the places where chemical toxins have been identified already to, to disrupt enzymatic function. You think that might have an influence on our ability to produce ATP energy? 
This, the, in, the integrity of the cell membrane is determined by the ability of the, of the cell membrane to pump minerals across it and keep an uh, electrical gradient, which then results in uh, life of the cell. If there's not enough ATP being produced, the cell dies. ATP is, is critical for most enzymatic actions. So this disrupts the, these chemicals disrupt the energy generation system of the body. This is a cytochrome oxidase system down at the bottom, which is cut off. But see how many additional steps are disrupted by, by known chemicals. There's several thousand chemicals that have been evaluated by the Environmental Protection Agency so far that are known to either cause immune dysregulation, malignancy, uh, allergy problems, uh, and so on. Uh, there are probably 50,000, 100,000 that are suspected of being contributors to, to ill health. Bottom line is we're poisoning ourselves to death. I want to talk a little bit about the, the inadequacy of nutrition. This is on uh, Roman numeral A. of sections uh, 2A and 3A, basically. Uh, <clears throat> in 1935, the U.S. Department of Agriculture did a study to assess the nutrient co content of the 600 most commonly eaten foods in the United States. And they concluded that there was just enough nutrient value in food at that time to uh, permit health. Uh, subsequent uh, analysis has revealed that there probably wasn't enough nutrient value in food in 1935 to get, regain health if you were ill. Okay? Now that, that never came out of our government. In 1969, the U.S. Department of Agriculture repeated part of that study. They analyzed 60 foods most commonly eaten, uh, bought in grocery stores in the United States, and they found that there had been a 70 percent nutrient loss in food between 1935 and 1969. 70% nutrient loss. Well, why did that happen? What happened between 1935 and 1969? We started adding pesticides and herbicides to our soil. Uh, the, the country, to a large degree, shifted from uh, one farmer to corporate farmer type uh, production of, of food products for the city, soon to be city dwellers. And they continued to grow. Uh, the same crops on the same ground year after year, leaching minerals out of the soil, not replacing them, and they didn't uh, practice some of the, uh, the soil protective techniques that should have been, so it allowed additional leaching of minerals from the soil by rain and, and uh, acid rain especially. And so before you know it, we have very little nutrient value to our food anymore. It's been estimated that in order for most people to maintain health nowadays, that you would have to eat between 4,000 and 5,000 calories per day just by eating food. How many of you uh, do enough physical activity to eat four or 5,000 calories per day? Not very many. Now the problem with eating that number of calories is that guess what? All that food's polluted so you get an extra concentration of pesticides and herbicides when you eat that many foods. This, uh, this part down at the bottom is uh, saying that this percentage on the right is not even getting 70% of the RDA. Now, most people in the nutrition field believe that uh, nutrient requirements are multiple, multiples of the RDA, not fractions of the RDA. Our government uh, didn't like this data when it came out and they decided to fix the problem by establishing a new uh, norm. They call it the RDI, which is less than the RDA. That's a good way to fix the problem, isn't it? <laughs> Oops, it's going to be cut off. Can you see that? 
so this kind of tells us what we're up against uh, when we try to prove something to our government in the United States. says that uh, 7,043 studies on vitamin E, uh, oh sorry, let's back up, 12,896 studies on vitamin C of which 5,546 deal with humans, 7,043 studies on vitamin E of which 3,205 deal with humans. In the total there have been more than 75,000 studies on nutrients that have been done, but it hasn't convinced our FDA yet. This was a study done at the Environmental Health Center in Dallas, with, with whom I'm working some now. And uh, they found that in very sick, uh, chemically sensitive environmental patients, that uh, there is a strong correlation between the mineral content in the body and the uh, severity of the chemical sensitivity, the illness. Now, this is a chicken and egg question. You know, did, did the person develop the chemical sensitivity because they became mineral depleted? Or did they stop absorbing minerals because they became chemically polluted? Uh, I think it's some of both. The strongest uh, correlation, well, you can see over there on the far right, the, the uh, p-value, the probability, most, most of the ones listed on the left, uh, you know, meet the uh, statistical probability, calcium, potassium, copper, zinc, manganese, chromium, phosphorus, selenium, silica, not to be confused with silicone, uh, barium, and sodium. Now, the, uh, one of the stronger ones there uh, was, uh, was the manganese. Uh, I find, and I'd like to see if I can find evidence of this in the literature when I get a chance to look for it, but I find that a lot of patients that have uh, big problems with mercury toxicity are magnesium, man, sorry, manganese depleted, and that when you replace the manganese, they seem to act less mercury toxic. Has anybody else observed that yet? Okay, so I'll put a bug in your ear. What was that third element? Mm, you got to me. <laughs> is, is this from the book or is it from this, uh, this one is in, this, this was in the Chemical Sensitivity book by Bill Ray. I'll, I'll have a overhead in a little while if you want to copy down the reference. I don't know if there is an SU. Pardon? I don't think there is an SU element. Oh, I don't know. I, I looked at the ones that I'm familiar with. Okay, this, this is just another, another study done also in the, in the environmental a unit in Dallas, but with a different set of patients. Uh, the reason I show this one also is that uh, the first two, mag magnesium and zinc, turned out by um, by the uh, initial analysis done uh, not to show much deficiency. But when when the person was given a, a either a magnesium or a zinc challenge and then had 24-hour urine collection before and after the challenge, if the person held on to more than half of the administered dose, then we knew that the patient was significantly depleted in magnesium or zinc, respectively. And they, they found that 40% of the patients were depleted in each of those by doing the challenge test. So all, the bottom line is that you can't always tell uh, just from a 24-hour from a urine collection without challenge or from a hair analysis or anything else whether they're magnesium or zinc depleted. These are some of the, the enzymes that are influenced by the minerals that we just talked about. This is also in the chemical sensitivity book. The nutrition chapter alone in this book has uh, 800 references. It's a well-written book. I don't agree with everything in it, but it's still a well-written book. Anyway, the minerals are the, are the cofactors for enzymes, and if you don't have enough uh, uh, action of enzymes, then 
the, the, act, the function of the body diminishes. Uh, enzymes are required not only for digestion, but for making energy in the, in the system, for making amino acids, for making proteins, for making other enzymes, for accomplishing a lot of different functions. And so, as a result of the lack of those enzymatic functions, you end up with some of these kind of symptoms is from magnesium deficiency. Now some of the magnesium deficiency symptoms are also related to the calcium magnesium uh, difference across the cell membrane. As we said just a minute ago, 40% of these patients are significantly magnesium de depleted. And so you'll get some of these symptoms just because of the uh, electrical imbalance across the cell membrane of the nervous system. For example, the, the tetany and the, and the uh, nervousness and the mus muscle tremors and cramps and stuff. This one I found to be interesting. Uh, there are a lot of different chemical pollutants that uh, appear to affect calmodulin. Calmodulin is a, uh, a protein that influences the regulation of, of calcium uh, within the cell. And I underlined the uh, microtubule disassembly um, to say that, uh, to, or to remind me to tell you that uh, there are studies in Germany that show that mercury disrupts the function of the microtubule. The microtubule uh, is a, a filament of proteins within a cell that help to move nutrients to the interior of the cell and to take chemical toxins that are inside the cell and move them out of the cell. So what happens then is if you become mercury toxic, your tubulin system becomes poisoned and you can't get rid of other poisons that are within the cell and you can't get other nutrients inside the cell to metabolize those toxins that are within the cell. So your cell becomes a garbage dump. Now the other, the other one that, uh, that Dr. Scheidel pointed out to me yesterday is that uh, phospholipase A2 is very important in prevention of cancer, in treatment of cancer. So if a person develops a, a, a phospholipase A2, A2 deficiency, then that may predispose them to malignancy. I think that's too much information. We're going to go on. <laughs> like, <clears throat> this is this is important. Uh, you know, if you if you try to evaluate what the nutritional status is of a patient, you can do it with just measuring, let's say, the vitamin B6 level in the blood or wherever. But what studies have shown is that that doesn't always reflect the true deficiency state of the patient because we actually want to know what the pyridoxal 5-phosphate action is inside the cell. Pyridoxal 5-phosphate is the active form of B6 inside the cell. So uh, certain laboratories have developed uh, techniques to measure the uh, content uh, or the, the action of um, enzymes that depend on these active forms of vitamins. And that's what, what this is about. The, um, the doctor's data who's, who's represented here in the booth uh, has, uh, has had some of those tests. The um, Metametrics lab out of uh, Georgia and the SpectraCell lab out of Houston has um, functional vitamin ass assessment tests if someone wants to try to determine what the nutritional status is. The, the, the functional test is a much, much more reliable test. This is just one example of a Metametrics uh, organic acid test that gives you some of that information. If you're going to get into this, you really have to spend a lot of time studying your biochemistry. Some of you have probably seen this before. Hopefully, hopefully all of the dentists have. Uh, I, I present it mostly for the benefit of the uh, laypersons in the audience. Uh, what, uh, what this shows is that uh, a high percentage over here of patients have symptom reduction whenever they get their uh, mercury amalgam problem taken care of in the mouth, when they get their toxic-free dentistry completed. <coughs> 
I believe strongly that that includes the uh, chelation process after the dental work is done though. You have to use you know, either Corella or, or garlic or DMPS or, or some type of chelator. And take the appropriate precautions to make sure that you don't overload the system with heavy metals as you're doing that work. I show this because there's, uh, this was done by our government and I disagree with it. They show that the, that the only source for methyl mercury, which is right here, is from fish. Well, most of us have a bacteria in our mouth and in our gut which convert, which can convert metal mercury into methyl mercury. Methyl mercury is a, a CH3 group attached to mercury and that um, methyl mercury has been found to be 100 times more toxic to the immune system and to the nervous system than metal mercury itself. So it's important to, to be aware of that. What year was that? Uh, that was 1990. Environmental health criteria. The World Health Organization says up here at the top. Uh, reference to this is also in the uh, Alternative Medicine Definitive Guidebook, um, which I'll give you a reference to in a minute. Now this came out of a book that has some interesting information in it. I don't agree with the title or with the, uh, uh, some of the content of the book, but it does have some in interesting information nonetheless. Um, what it shows is the, is the total uh, point score over here on the far right margin of relative risk of, of a heavy metal creating a malignant process based on analyzing many of the animal and human studies in the English literature. And you should not confuse the chromate on the left margin with, uh, with the brand name nutrient uh, chromium polynicotinate, which is available at the health food store. We're talking about chromium oxide here, chromium dioxide, a, a, an oxidized form of chromium that's the, uh, the uh, cancer inducer with a, with a high score over on the right margin. But we see that nickel and uh, cadmium and and lead are very strong uh, inducers of, of malignant process. Well, published this, book? this published this year actually. It's, a, it's called The Cure for All Cancers. That's also here in the reference stack at the end. Anybody that wants to see it? You, you will get reference. Yeah, we'll flash it up there in just a minute. This also came out of that same book. Uh, it's, it's written, this book is written primarily for the lay public. Um, so they did a pictorial type approach a lot of people that have um, cancer or also have chemical toxicity, also have toxic brain overload and have a hard time reading and understanding, so pictures weren't great. But uh, we have, we have cad cadmium down there at the bottom on that, on that page. Uh, one, of, you know, one of the sources is from the, from the piping. Arsenic from, from furniture coverings and sprays and whatnot. PCBs are uh, polychlorinated uh, biphenyls, which are, which are cancer-causing substances found in the laundry detergent and the dishwashing detergent, and uh, in my opinion are probably a, a very significant threat to health for a lot of different reasons, and so people need to be aware that they're poisoning themselves that way and can avoid that by making their own dishwashing soap especially because that's going right straight into your system. Uh, the, uh, you can make your own dishwashing soap from, uh, from, e from either shaving some uh, uh, glycerin soap uh, and making it into a liquid or, or, uh, or using some uh, mule team borax uh, as, a, as a soap. And those don't have the same degree of pollution. A lot of people don't think about the degree of toxicity that they get through their skin. You know, when we, when we uh, put a water purifier in our house, a lot of times we put it on the kitchen sink and uh, everything that, uh, that runs through that water purifier uh, is cleaned up pretty well and we drink that and we're, we think we're doing a lot of good stuff for our bodies, but we, the studies show that about 60% about of the chemical toxins that we get from water come through our skin, not through, through our gut.
Okay, and same thing for the clothes that we wash in the dish wa in the in the washing machine that have been polluted with uh, laundry detergents. As soon as you perspire the least little bit, you absorb some of the PCBs through the skin into the bloodstream. Are there any commercial detergents that uh, do not have a specific I found a, uh, a material from uh, the Neolife company that, that I feel is safe. Uh, they have a red product and a green product. The red product is more for uh, you know, countertops and, and washing dishes and things like that, a really strong uh, cleaner. And the green can be used in varying dilutions for uh, you know, face, skin, body, etc. Uh, but uh, other than those two, and you know, borax and uh, the uh, Neutrogena type, uh, you know, glycerin soaps, or the uh, Castile type soap, you know, the plain old lye soaps, uh, most of the rest of them are polluted with either PCBs or, or other undesirable chemicals. Yes, sir. Mink oil soap? I'm not familiar with it. BioClean? BioClean? Citrus, uh, citrus seed extract soap, plates. Huh. Where is that from? The United States. I don't have the number with me. Oh. It's BioClean company. I think they all have to share information amongst each other for, you know, like uh, soaps that you use for your hands or, or dental instruments or whatever in the office because probably somebody in the group has found something that is pure. There's probably quite a few of you that are that are either chemically sensitive because I find that a lot of dentists become chemically sensitive because of the mercury buildup in their systems and the toxins that build up because of that. <coughs> um, I want to talk, talk about uh, bowel a little bit. Now this is, this is a double picture so don't let it confuse you. The, uh, the uh, lung is really not in the, the uh, descending colon. That is the uh, that is one of the uh, acupressure acupuncture meridian points for the lung in the bowel. We we find uh, that patients that have a lesion in that part of their colon oftentimes will have uh, a, a, some type of lung process in the left lung. And um, Doug may may have seen some of this kind of thing, or, or Dr. Speckhart may have. And so the, these points came from, from Chinese medicine, basically, and from uh, EAV and uh, energy medicine, medicine observations. Uh, the, the, the bowel um, becomes gradually polluted as we age because of uh, several factors. One is uh, a rampant widespread use of refined sugars, which acts as a, a paralytic to the uh, bowel and to the gallbladder and to the hepatobiliary system. When you paralyze the smooth muscle in the wall of the bile ducts, uh, the bile doesn't get dumped out during your meals, and bile is one of the stimuluses for contraction of the rest of the gut. Uh, Likewise, toxins that should have been dumped out of the gallbladder and the biliary system during a meal don't get dumped out and they back up into the liver and poison the liver. So what I find in practice is that if you, if you can identify and address the uh, bowel toxic problems first, you're going to be way ahead of the game. If you, if you go right straight to uh, trying to detox the tissues and ignore the bowel and the liver and gallbladder, you're not going to get to the same end goal. Uh, probably at all, or if you do, it'll take a long time. The other thing that poisons the uh, bowel progressively is uh, refined white flour. Uh, when you're growing up, I'm sure some of you made uh, paper mache. Paper mache is uh, refined white flour 
mixed with water to make a paste and then you put some paper down in that paste and then paste it on the outside of a balloon or some other type of uh, object and it, uh, when it dries it maintains that shape. Well, what happens then uh, over time is that we develop, we actually paper mache the inner wall of our gut. And so then we have an inner lining of the, the false lining of the bowel here and the real lining out here. Guess what? The, the food that's coming down the track here to, 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 to give nutrition to our body can't get through the false lining to get to the true lining of the gut. So uh, we aren't what we eat, we are what we, are what we assimilate or absorb. So the other thing that happens behind that false lining of the gut is um, anaerobic bacteria start growing and producing very serious toxins. The Clostridia family produces some of the more severe toxins. When, those, uh, when, when you grow some of the toxins from Clostridia in culture and then uh, purify those, get all the bacteria out and inject those purified toxins into lab animals, a minute amount of that toxin will kill the animal. So it's very important uh, from, from my experience and from the experience of others that have been doing this uh, for many years to get that false lining of the gut out. There's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, the, the fastest way that I've found to do it is to use a combination of a cleaned up diet, i.e. no sugar, uh, no refined white flour, uh, l a lot less dairy, a lot less uh, Meat, meats in most cases, and a lot more vegetables and fruits and roughage, and extra fiber. At the turn of the century in the United States, in 1900, the average fiber intake per day was 200 grams. Now the average fiber intake is around 15 grams per day. So we've had a dr drastic loss of fiber from our diet. So if you put some of that back in the form of foods, vegetables and fruits, and then add some more psyllium or oat bran or other, other fibers, you can pull water into the gut and create a, a super duper broom to sweep this false lining off the uh, true lining of your bowel. The other thing that, uh, that I use is, uh, is, chole is uh, ozonated cholemics. Now cholema is somewhat like a colonic, but uh, you do it with gravity and the patient can do it at home. They don't have to go to a special facility to get it done. So they can do it as often as they need to for the rest of their life. You fill uh, a five gallon bucket with purified water. You bubble ozone into the water for 15 to 30 minutes at least. And then while ozone is still bubbling into the water, you run uh, water out of, the, out of a tube at the bottom of the bucket into the um, bowel. Looks something like this. So here's the, here's the bucket up here, ozone bubbling in right there, fluid coming out the bottom, runs into the rectum here, and the, the, the ozone is absorbed through the rectal uh, sigmoid colon bowel uh, lining where there's not as much of the false lining. The ozone uh, gets into the bloodstream, is carried through the portal circulation back toward the liver, and part of the ozone goes back through the bowel wall in the, of the small bowel in the opposite direction and kills some of the bacteria that are between the true lining and the false lining. When those bacteria are being killed in that fashion, they produce gas bubbles, which causes a, a pressure effect to push the false lining away from the true lining. I have seen patients that did that con consecutively for three to seven days have, have long rubbery ropey strands of stool that actually had a lumen in it, just looked like a, a, a garden hose, come out in the toilet anywhere from a foot long to sometimes 15 feet long. Okay, couldn't happen, could it? I've seen it. So it's very important to get that false lining out of the gut. That's a critical part of the detoxification process. Question, question. Do you ever, do you ever recommend ozone and sulfation? Say it again. Do you ever recommend the ozone and sulfation? This direct ozone application. Yeah. 
Uh, I have, haven't used that very much. It's not that it's that I don't believe in it. That there's uh, you have to understand practicing in Texas as I have. There's certain restrictions. You can you can purify water with whatever technique you want to, but when you start putting ozone gas in the rectum, you're you're uh, practicing too too close to the fringe. <laughs> okay, ozone uh, is used to purify the water, the drinking water in the city of Los Angeles. So uh, you know they're, they're going to have a hard time saying that I can't purify. Uh, water with ozone if the city, entire city of Los Angeles can. Yes, ma'am? So when they look at, uh, look at the rectum through sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy, are they looking at the false lining? In most cases, the bulk of this false lining comes out of the small bowel. There's, no, there's not any good techniques to look at the jejunum and ileum. Jejunum is about 20, you know, 15 or 20 feet long, jejunum and ileum collectively. And that's where most of this, uh, the uh, false lining comes from. I think some of these patients do get, uh, when they go through the bowel prep, they do get chunks of stuff breaking loose from the from the colon wall, the large bowel wall, uh, and it doesn't. The, when the colonoscopist looks in there, he doesn't see much of that stuff. Okay, but we don't look past the ileocecal valve, and when we're coming from above, we don't look past the duodenum. Right. So do you think the false lining extends down also into the colon? Yes, it does. It does in many cases. Are ozone generators commercially available? Yes, in the United States, for the purpose of water purification. Okay, about seven or eight hundred dollars to, uh, to to make ozone with an ultraviolet light from room air, as long as you have a hundred and ten uh, electrical plug. Now, I don't advocate using that ozone for uh, uh, intravenous or other uses because there may be some gases contaminants of that. Uh, for that purpose, but it works great for purif purifying water. Yes. Yeah, do you think you might be manufacturing hydrogen peroxide? <coughs> Maybe. Maybe so. Let's see. <coughs> By the way, psyllium, uh, which is a very common fiber used, uh, absorbs 40 times its weight in water. So if you don't take a bunch of water, you're going to get a brick in your bowel. <laughs> And you don't want a brick in there. You just want something, a broom, okay, to sweep the stuff out. Bricks are not good. <laughs> I understand a lot of the sewing has. Yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, the the best psyllium that I've found so far is uh, Nature Sunshine bulk psyllium or, or ca encapsulated psyllium. They try to get uh, you know <laughs> pesticide-free uh, psyllium. Uh, you know, the conventional medical community says, well, use Metamucil. Well. With Metamucil, you have a choice of either sugar added to make it sweet or NutraSweet added to make it sweet, oh. both, both of which are not in colors, yeah. So that Metamucil is not a choice in my opinion. Uh, just a quickie, Dr. Uh, Burkett uh, was the fellow after, after whom Burkitt's lymphoma was named. Um, did a study in uh, Africa, and he found he, Englishmen do strange things. Uh, they they went down there and analyzed the size and frequency of bowel movements of the natives of Africa. <laughs> okay, that must have been a fun project for some uh, medical student, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, what what he found is that the size and frequency of the stool was inversely proportional to the number of occupied hospital beds in the region studied. <laughs> Maybe I should say that in a different way. The, the more, the more, uh, the larger the stools and the more frequent the stools, the less likely the hospital beds were to be occupied. Okay? I also sometimes use uh, a, a vitamin C flush when it comes to getting rid of junk in the bowel, and uh, that's pretty easy to do. Uh, you, you start out with uh, oh, two or 3,000 milligrams of vitamin C by mouth, and uh, every couple of hours uh, increase the dose uh, or take another dose, uh, and uh, eventually your, your body will absorb what it's going to out of the bowel, and the rest of it ends up in the colon along with water. And, uh, that uh, does not get rid of this false lining that I was talking about, but it does help to detox the patient fairly rapidly by pumping some of those toxins that have been uh, building up there in the bowel into the toilet rapidly. 
The other thing I sometimes use uh, is, is uh, activated charcoal or super activated charcoal to bind up toxins when patients get too toxic in the detoxification process. But as I said yesterday, uh, that the, the activated charcoal does bind up not just the things that you want to bind up, but it also binds up vitamins and, uh, and medications that the patient might need for survival for that time being, such as uh, heart medications and whatnot. So if you're going to use activated charcoal, keep that, keep that in mind. I, I haven't found that vitamin C seems to bind the uh, medications that uh, avidly, so you can use that m more safely as a uh, detoxifier. Yes, sir. So for your ozone, is the only way to get the pulse lining out? No, but as I said earlier, you, you can get the pulse lining out if you if you're very active with herbal laxatives, vitamin C, uh, lots of psyllium, lots of fluid. No, fi no, uh, no dairy, no sugar, no flour no meats for several days, you'll start seeing some of that false lining come out that way too usually, uh, but, but it's a much more laborious process. And what about uh, ozone uh, IV? About that? I haven't seen that to help uh, the, the, the false lining problem. Apparently you're not getting enough high enough concentration of the ozone at the uh, mucosal layer in the small bowel or, or whatever. I, I, I'm not even sure if there might not be a reflex mechanism from the colon back up to the small bowel to cause it to uh, squeeze or contract, uh, and so so something that you're doing at the sigmoid colon rectal level, stimulating the uh, the small bowel in reverse. How much time do you do that? Uh, five or ten minutes or longer? It takes about 15 minutes to run in five gallons of uh, ozonated water for most adults, and uh, that's assuming that that you're not uh, completely uh, backed up to your ears with uh, stool. Uh, most people carry around at least 10 pounds of stool in their bowel. Um, there's, uh, there have been autopsy studies uh, where, pay, where they dug anywhere from, from uh, 80 to 120 pounds of stool out of an autopsy, out of a corpse. So uh, we're, when they say you're full of, I mean you really are full of. <laughs> uh, there, there are, it's important as far as the bowel too, let me say this, that, that when, you, when you use ozone to try to replenish the bowel with good quality bacteria after you get the bad bacteria out. And um, the, the lactobacillus acidophilus is the bacteria that's most commonly found in health food stores for that purpose. But I find that lactobacillus acidophilus is a very fragile organism. It uh, doesn't tolerate its trip through the hydrochloric acid content of the stomach and it uh, frequently uh, doesn't establish itself very well on the small and large bowel uh, lining because of uh, inadequacy of nutrients there or inadequacy of, of uh, the, the right amount of lactic acid or, or other, other uh, environmental factors. So what, what I've done is actually used uh, you know, bifidobacteria along with lactobacillus acidophilus and several other species all in one preparation mixed with fructose oligosaccharide which is uh, extract of the Jerusalem artichoke or uh, a malt, barley malt extract to assist in the reestablishment of friendly bacteria on the lining of the, of the bowel. What happens is if you can reestablish enough of the friendly bacteria in the lining of the bowel they maintain a healthy gut after that and you don't have to keep working at it as hard. Okay, so uh, very important to uh, reestablish that. Uh, there's a, there are very, very uh, specific pHs of the gastrointestinal tract as we travel through. Uh, there's fairly uh, some degree of uh, alkalinity until you get to the stomach, a lot of acidity in the stomach. As soon as you get into, this, uh, into the duodenum, the pancreas dumps the bicarbonate into the duodenum, so you become very alkaline again. By the time you get to the rectum, the stool should be acidic again. At a, re at a pH of about five, or maybe six, uh, and if, so if you get a, al a very alkaline stool, then that means you've got the wrong kind of bugs up inside you that are producing things that aren't conducive to health, as well, you know, toxins and whatnot. Uh, let me talk just castor oil. Uh, I'm not. I don't use that very often. I think that there's better choices. Uh, some some of the ones we just mentioned. Um, Castor oil is basically just a, a real bad irritant of the bowel. It doesn't accomplish some of that, some other desired effects. 
Um, let me say something just for a moment about uh, hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Uh, studies show that as we age, we lose hydrochloric acid producing cells in our stomach. The parietal cells that make hydrochloric acid are damaged sequentially by a multitude of factors. Alcohol, nicotine, caffeine, stress, mercury and certain other heavy metals, pesticides, and food allergens are just a few of those things that damage those parietal cells. If we lose the ability to uh, produce hydrochloric acid in the stomach, several things happen. First of all, the stomach is a very important barrier to contracting parasitic illness. So the parasites that you eat in your food and water go straight through the stomach undamaged and set up shop in the small and large bowel. So it's very important to re try to reestablish the stomach acidity. Uh, the, 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 the way that I go about trying to reestablish the stomach acidity is to get rid of the factors that caused the loss of stomach acid in the first place, alcohol, nicotine, caffeine, excessive emotional stress, uh, heavy metals, pesticides, and uh, so on, and food, food allergies, try to avoid the, the strongest food allergies as well. And then at the same time, give uh, herbs and uh, things that help to stimulate the stomach to regenerate uh, the, the parietal cells. Aloe vera, uh, licorice, and uh, cabbage are all three very good herbs to, to help to regenerate the stomach lining the parietal cell production. Uh, if, if, you, if you can't uh, make acid in the stomach, you also cannot absorb minerals properly, and you cannot break down proteins into amino acids amino acids that we absorb out of our gut become the building blocks for uh, digestive enzymes in our gut, metabolic enzymes inside of our cells, neurotransmitters in the brain, uh, hormonal transmitters in our body. So you see that the whole thing comes crashing down just because of loss of the hydrochloric acid. So I find that that's a, a very common problem. 50% of the people age 50 will have inadequate hydrochloric acid 70% of the people age 70 will have inadequate hydrochloric acid to digest foods. 90% of the people age 90 will have it, according to a study done years ago at Mayo or, or Harvard. I yes, sir. So That's what I just said. Yes, sir. No, uh, Dr. Uh, Jonathan Wright's done some of those studies and published some of his work, uh, but that's how the studies uh, well, they actually stuck back then, this is about 20 years ago, they stuck tubes down patients' noses into their uh, stomach and analyzed uh, hydrochloric acid the, the hard way. Do you think that would be a good way to go? Uh, what I do, I use, as I said, I use a lot of uh, energy medicine assessing patients in my practice, and I use uh, uh, mineral analysis also as a way to know whether a person has hydrochloric acid deficiency. So I, I can I can find out in most cases the same answer without putting them through a, a procedure that may be uncomfortable for them. I, I don't disagree with it, it's just additional expense and additional hassle for the patient if you can find out the same thing. And if you, if you use the things that I'm talking about, those are things that you should, should do for your health probably anyway. Uh, if you have a patient that's not motivated at all, the Heidelberg test is probably a good idea to get them motivated to do what they need to to get well. It's a, a, a capsule attached to a wire that you swallow that has a pH sensor on it that, that gives you readings from the stomach acid, and uh, you know it's it, it's uh, it's not a it's not that uncomfortable to swallow thing, but uh, some some patients uh, object to it. A few cases, the little capsule on the end has been disconnected from the wire, and so then you have to. It's, 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 a, it's a radio it's broadcast a radio. pH meter. It's a radio. Oh, well, you, only, I, you only attach a string if you want to recover it and pull it back out. Yeah. The thread. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. it passes through. Yeah. So yeah, we are a little recording pH meter. There's a radio oh. transmitter. Radio transmitter. Yeah. 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 It, it's additional useful information, but uh, I haven't found it necessary to use. Uh, but uh, keep trying and to uh, I, I keep trying to expand my uh, paradigm and my horizons and, and get and get new useful information. Let's see. I, I really didn't talk about it that much, but you can read uh, some of the things we're talking about for removal of electromagnetic and uh, radiation uh, sources there. Um, 
I do have one comment since we're down here in the uh, sun uh, in Puerto Vallarta. Uh, the, the sunscreens that are on the market do not block ultraviolet C radiation very well at all. And uh, UVC is a cancer-causing uh, radiation. So what I do when I'm going to spend much time out in the sun is take extra doses, extra amounts of the other antioxidant nutrients that do help protect against uh, sunlight radiation-induced cancer, uh, it appears, which include uh, vitamin E, vitamin C, beta-carotene, and uh, pycnogenol. Now pycnogenol, P-Y-C-N-O-G-E-N-O-L, pycnogenol is a is an extract of either the uh, grape seed or the uh, bark of the maritime pine tree. Either one of those have fairly good uh, anthocyanidins, which are about 30 to 50 times stronger antioxidants than vitamin E or C per milligram. And it's a fat-soluble antioxidant that does get into your brain. So guess what part of your body the sun usually hits first? And that's why I use pycnogenol. Okay, um, try to move a little faster here now through the rest of this. Uh, this is just some of the herbs that can be used to, uh, to help the liver along in, in its de detoxification process. I do use coffee, suggest coffee enemas to the patients that are most toxic from uh, a, a detoxification process and that does seem to work well. Um, it's usually uh, anywhere from, from two to four cups of uh, caffeinated brewed coffee filtered and uh, cooled and cooled to body temperature and run in and, and retained at least, run in over about 15, 20 minutes and retained at least 15, 20 minutes before evacuating. The, the caffeine in the coffee stimulates the contraction of the, of the bile ducts and the gallbladder to dump toxins in the bowel. Do not do coffee enemas unless you've already done some work on cleaning the bowel out because if you dump those toxins from the gallbladder into the bowel and they can't get into the toilet, that's not going to do you much good. Uh, I also suggest patients use uh, bitter and sour foods, especially toward the beginning of their meals, to stimulate their bile ducts to contract and try to avoid sugars because that inhibits the contraction of the bile ducts. And in some patients we use what we call a gallbladder flush, which is uh, anywhere from a quarter to a half cup of, of olive oil followed by all the juice of a, of a large organic lemon and then sit real still for a while <laughs> because it will make you nauseated but that helps to uh, pump a lot, a lot of junk out of the uh, um, bile system for patients that are adverse to using coffee rectally. Um, olive oil and lemon juice about a quarter cup of each. Now. Uh, methionine is an amino acid, uh, probably, it, it's, a, it's an antioxidant uh, amino acid uh, that's a precursor for cysteine, and cysteine is a precursor for glutathione. Uh, L-carnitine uh, is, a, is a carrier for nutrients across the cell membrane, uh, amino acids, fats, and so on. Uh, the rest of these are herbs. Uh, a couple that you would probably recognize by the common names are turmeric, curcuma longa, uh, the uh, milk thistle here, psyllium marianum, and uh, glyceriza glabrata is licorice. Echinacea is a is a stimulator of immune function in the in the immune cells of the liver. This is some of the places that uh, toxins end up concentrating in the body when they get in. Uh, depending on the type of toxin, they concentrate uh, in different locations. Um, we've got the we've got the reference for this in in the uh, section here at the end. No, that's from a uh, uh, encyclopedia of uh, no encyclopedia of alternative medicine. Uh, Pizarro, I think is his name. Yes. Uh, your thoughts at this juncture, your thoughts on fasting along with Yes, uh, I, I do uh, suggest some fasting uh, to my patients. Uh, the, 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 the fasting that I suggest is not commonly a water fast, though. The fasting is usually a, a modified fast where they consume 
uh, organic lemonade made with maple syrup or if they can't tolerate maple syrup they can make it with uh, honey or if they can't tolerate either one of those uh, if they can get some boot bootleg stevia stevia is a, an herb from China that has a, a fairly palatable sweet taste uh, but you do uh, uh, lemon juice and uh, let's say maple syrup uh, fast uh, in some cases we have them also consume uh, some uh, diluted or thinned vegetable juices uh, so about every hour all day long they're drinking some kind of calorie containing fluid and if they have to they get up halfway through the night and do the same a lot of our patients that have uh, chemical sensitivity environmental sensitivity toxins will have uh, yeast and fungal overgrowth in their gut uh, that the yeast and fungus is pulling sugar out of their bloodstream and using up that sugar for their own metabolism and that's one of the reasons why patients with that condition get hypoglycemic and so if you actually go on a water fast they can get pretty bad sick they'll they'll have especially if they've already become adrenal exhausted they'll they'll actually sometimes get uh, shocky on you so you can't uh, take that risk I don't think in a lot of them uh, but the but the but the fasting does seem to help to mobilize toxins out of the out of the cells into the bloodstream from the bloodstream hopefully into the liver or the gallbladder if they're strong enough with that uh, calorie input to also do some exercise to heat up their body and put some uh, sebum or sweat out of the skin and that uh, removes some more toxins if they take a loop cool shower immediately after the exercise I usually have patients fast for no more than three to five days at a time and they can leave it off for three to five days and then go at it again uh, they just need a little break now and then. I, uh, s some doctors have used up to 10 days of fasting. Uh, if the patient's tolerating that well, that's okay, but I think you should need to be careful not over overtax the system. Yes, ma'am? With um, sick children, my kids are, were all supposed in utero with mercury poisoning because of my handling of it. Would you recommend, I mean, is there an age where maybe this is not good for a child about 10 years? I wouldn't do long fasts in kids uh, because I think it causes too much. Uh, imbalance of the nutrients that they're requiring to, to grow uh, you know adults are different in the sense that they've already um, achieved their growth spurt and uh, their nutrient requirements are not uh, as intense as children and children can become pretty badly imbalanced pretty fast if you uh, calorie deplete them okay uh, this is some uh, some toxins and some chemical and some symptoms that occur as a result of those chemical toxins. Um, you see that most of them result in fatigue. Many of them result in paresthesias. The PBBs are polybrominated biphenyls, so that's uh, two cycle, uh, two, two hydrocarbon rings, and uh, some bromine molecules attached to it. The PCB is polychlorinated or chlorine molecules attached in place of the bromine. The PCBs, as we talked about earlier, are found in the dishwashing detergents and the laundry detergents and whatnot. And the OP, okay, the OP, by, by the way, was the uh, the uh, uh, or, uh, the pesticides. Okay, next step of detoxification, which I touched on just a minute ago. Uh, this is this is one of many uh, saunas on the mar on the market that you can purchase. Sorry, there's there's the information out at the bottom. But uh, the uh, the saunas sauna technique for detoxification goes way back. I mean, back to Greece, uh, maybe further. But uh, the countries that were doing it back then most of them stopped doing it except one which was Finland and Finland continued to use sauna on a regular basis as a part of life as part of daily living and most people would go to the sauna at least once a week in Finland and uh, that was uh, that was fortuitous for uh, people that are working with 20th century environmental medicine because uh, they found that uh, that many patients that went through that uh, got a whole lot better symptomatically as a result of doing the going to Finland and, and going through the, the saunas. So then um, so, several of the environmental doctors in the in this country started 
putting in saunas in their offices or in their hospitals or clinics and, uh, and using that as a technique to facilitate uh, detoxification. The, the finished saunas uh, usually have a wooden stove that puts out uh, organic toxins, so that's not preferable. You usually need to have another heating source. You can either have water running through a metal radiator to put out uh, radiant heat, or you can have a uh, electrical uh, appliance to put out, uh, electrical coil to put out heat, as long as the patient's not electromagnetically sensitive. And so um, instead of going up to maybe 200 degrees Fahrenheit like they do in Finland, that's a, that's a pretty hot sauna. Uh, we find that most patients can get pretty good benefit from uh, doing a sauna at uh, 130 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. They may get their body temperature up to 105, 106 degrees Fahrenheit, core body temperature. And uh, they usually have to start out at a fairly uh, low number of minutes exposure and see how they tolerate it and then gradually build up over time. They may, may only go in for five minutes the first time they do it. Before a person goes into the sauna, they usually need to take certain types of nutrients to facilitate uh, blood flow, to facilitate uh, metabolism of enzymes in the liver, to facilitate binding of toxin, fat soluble toxins that come out of the tissues. So vitamin C, vitamin B3 or niacin, which stimulates blood flow, uh, certain other B vitamins, uh, some minerals, and uh, uh, adequate amounts of fluid before you go into the sauna and, and adequate amounts of fluid by mouth after you come out of the sauna, along with uh, a good quality organic uh, cold pressed vegetable oil before you go into the uh, sauna, uh, either olive oil or flaxseed oil or canola oil or corn oil, as long as you don't have an allergy to the oil that you pick. And th those oils are absorbed through the bowel wall into the bloodstream, so you get uh, uh, micelles, little fat globules in the blood, and the chemicals, the fat soluble chemicals that are being mobilized out of cells from the heat process, latch onto those fat globules as they go by, and the fat globules carry them to the to the liver for processing, and they get uh, packaged up, con conjugated and packaged up, and moved out. Uh, through the liver and gallbladder into the bowel. If the bowel's working, then that goes on into the toilet. Now, some, some of the fat soluble toxins that are coming out of the cells as a result of uh, the sauna depuration therapy, the heat depuration therapy, as, as the, uh, the uh, people in the field call it, will, um, the, the, uh, the sauna will help to uh, move toxins into the bloodstream that go by sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands, oil glands on the skin, also are a means of excreting from the body some of the fat-soluble toxins. And so that's why it's so important immediately after you come out of the sauna to go directly into a Luke cool shower with a non-toxic soap to wash those fat-soluble toxins off the skin surface down the drain. So you use a, gl a glycerin soap or a, or a uh, Castile soap again for that purpose. Out of the last 1,000 patients uh, treated with heat deprivation or sauna therapy in Dallas, uh, through these are through the Environmental Center. Uh, this is the number of patients that had any degree of side effects or adverse effects, and uh, I'd say that's a fairly low uh, risk procedure uh, because uh, you know most most of none of no no deaths. First of all, no deaths. <laughs> and uh, and the, the, the most frequent was the elevated liver battery down here at the bottom. And that uh, is actually, I find, preventable in the ones that we've done sauna on by giving uh, some of those herbs that we threw up on the slide earlier, the uh, milk thistle and uh, some glutathione and some uh, sometimes some N-acetylcysteine which is a, a pre precursor for glutathione and a, a toxin binder in its own right. With the process of, of heat deprivation therapy or sauna therapy, you also mobilize not only fat-soluble toxins from the cells, but also m many of the heavy metals, and they come out through the through the skin and through the uh, uh, through the gut. Almost finished here now. Yes. Uh, we, we use uh, sometimes a, uh, a, a, a bath 
so to speak, but uh, not just a hot tub. We add uh, about a uh, half a cup to a cup of a very purified clay to the bath. So it's kind of like taking a hot mud bath. Okay, Clay very, very avidly binds toxins that are coming out through the skin and keeps them from going back into the skin in another spot. Okay, If, if you go into, into a hot tub, uh, in most cases you're just recycling. You're not getting a net loss because that's water and most of the toxins we're trying to get rid of are not water soluble. Okay? Yes ma'am? Uh, do you have any experience with the silicone? Some. It goes yeah. out? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, it's a very slow process. It's one of the harder things to remove uh, with, with heat deprivation therapy. But the, uh, but the results that we've seen are, are very good. Uh, what we want to do is to be able to collect more data on those patients to find out how we're accomplishing the symptom relief that we have accomplished. Uh, I think that women that have silicone toxicity have a combination of heavy metal toxicity, pesticide toxicity, PCB toxicity, uh, formaldehyde, uh, benzene, xylene, and all those others. And uh, as I'll show you in just a moment, the, the heat deprivation definitely removes those. So what we're doing is we're lowering the level in that barrel that we showed up there on the first slide of all those other toxins that are having a negative effect on the immune system, the hormonal system, the central nervous system, the liver, and so on. Uh, but anyway, this is, the, this is the overall success rate uh, in, the, in the environmental center on uh, all comers, all types of chemical toxin uh, that are measurable by uh, you know, blood or urine tests, 78% uh, 78, 78%, uh, improvement in symptoms and 71% reduction in chemical toxin load on objective testing. This is how some of the chemicals come out. They don't come out all at the same time. They come out in layers. Styr oops. Yeah, heck. Styrene came out first in this patient, then benzene, a little bit of ethyl benzene, and then finally toluene and xylene came out. And that's over a 27 week period, okay? So if we had stopped the, the, the sauna therapy and the other detoxification therapies after 12 weeks, we wouldn't even gotten the xylene and the toluene out. Question. Yes? What's the difference between vapor and sauna? Okay, uh, the sauna that we use is a dry sauna, no, no steam, no, no gas because that doesn't allow adequate uh, evaporation off the skin surface. Here's just some examples. Yeah, here's some examples of the of the total uh, degree of drop of these of these chemicals. Oh boy, barely fits on there. But you know, in pentane has a has a 70 percent uh, drop. You know, in heptane has a 100 percent drop. You know, so you can see we're we're, we're with with these uh, smaller uh, solvent type molecules that we get a pretty good reduction in the, in the uh, level of those from the bloodstream uh, over time. Are these weak, uh, weekly saunas? Uh, no. Uh, the, the, the saunas are usually done um, in the beginning two to three times per day. Per day. Yeah, we're talking about sick patients in this group. Okay, now, if a person here in this room uh, that's uh, still in, uh, let's say, uh, Act 1, 2, or 3 of their life toxicity process, uh, that person may, may do fine just doing, uh, you know, one or two saunas per week to keep their load down. But if you've already gotten into Act, you know, 4, 5, 6, 7, you sure as heck better, better do a little more aggressively than that. How do you compare it to steam? To steam? It's, a, it's more efficient, more effective. So, no, why? Because of the evaporation. It needs to be individualized. Some people have problems with, with the dry sauna because they're using a uh, electromagnetic coil to generate the heat and they're electromagnetically sensitive so it takes them several hours or days to recover from that electromagnetic exposure. 
you know, each person needs to be evaluated for their own individual needs. That you may be, you may find that if you do well in steam, you'd do even better in a, uh, you know, a clay bath at the house. You know, maybe easier and less hassle. Let's see if there's anything else important here. There's just some more more chemicals. We've seen enough chemicals. Immune dysfunction. Yes. Uh, blood specimens. Uh, uh, usually, you do that right after a sonic therapy because that's when you're going to have the highest content of the of the chemical toxin in the blood. Okay, get get rid of benzene from your products. This is in the Cure for All Cancer book. Okay, benzene stimulates uh, is a toxin directly, but also stimulates certain parasite growth. It's got benzene in it. Everything on that list had benzene in it. Get rid of things that have high amounts of, of isopropyl alcohol in them. Uh, I think most ma makeup products need to be switched to uh, ethyl alcohol as a, as a base rather than uh, isopropyl alcohol. And the reason is we see evidence that uh, the isopropyl alcohol will stimulate a flatworm in the liver or gut to convert into uh, from, from egg form into a, uh, a viable adult form which produces toxins uh, including a, a tumor growth factor, orthophosphotyrosine. Yes, sir? Sauna? Uh, for, the, for the very ill patients, usually two to three times a day, but they need to be monitored closely. Uh, that's for candida. I think that's it. Well, we can see that we need more, uh, more detox information. Yeah. Now, we need more time. acupuncture in your practice? Yeah. There's a there's a book reference for that, uh, you know, treatment without needles, electric acupuncture without needles, uh, that, that I like, and I use uh, treatment for tinnitus, acupuncture, non-invasive, you know, acupressure treatment for gingivitis. It's in this, in this group here. It's uh, acupuncture without needles. Yeah, we'll, we'll get, why don't we just make a copy of the references uh, okay. on a piece of paper? Well, Lee, well, we're going we're gonna to have you do this again uh, next time, and you can continue, but we, we out of That's respect for the, uh, shorten it up, because we've added a little length to the program. I want to thank you, Lee, for your It's kind of hard to say, uh, Cut it short when we're having fun, you know. But uh, it's, uh, we're going to take a break now for half an hour, so let's get back here at a quarter after. And, and don't forget that this evening, uh, after the meeting, the uh, hospitality next door. Yeah, here's the uh, references here. Just go and see the books. These are the books. That's the alternative medicine book. Oh, this is the one in Goldberg. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Psychopedia of Natural Medicine is yeah, that by, uh, that's bizarre.